And welcome back, everybody, to coverage here at the Players Tour Finals. I'm Marshall Seckler. Thank you so much for coming along for coverage here. We're watching a lot of standard today. Seven rounds, in fact. We're heading into round number three. But before we get there, I got to introduce my booth partner for this event, Monty Davuti. Monty, it's great to have you alongside me here in the booth. Hi, Marshall. It's great to be here. Very excited for all the amazing action we're watching today. Now, you've dipped your toe into the into the coverage pool a bit here as of late, but maybe some of our viewers aren't as familiar with who you are and what you've done in Magic. So give us the cliff notes. Who are and uh, what have you done in, in Magic? Uh, so my name is Monty. I've been playing Magic for about 11 years now since the release of Lorwyn. Uh, for most of that time, my endeavors have really be, been competitive focus trying to compete on the grand prix scale on the pro tour scale uh and that's led to a grand prix victory some decent results here and there and just a lot of good times that a lot of friends made yeah you won a, a massive tournament in vegas and i happen to know you personally because we're from the same neck of the woods and also that's when i started playing as well so you and i both kind of came in at the same time so i've seen you at ptqs and known you for a really long time and i'm super excited to have you alongside me here uh, in the coverage booth yeah it's just the pacific northwest had such an incredible magic the gathering scene which makes sense considering it's the home of magic so i got to meet so many wizards employees and incredible magic players throughout the years just coming up in that magic scene that's right now when it comes to uh kind of working your career at this point as far as magic goes um you've been getting good opportunities here to do coverage including this one here at the players tour finals and some other events as well but also you're an excellent player how do you kind of decide if you want to do booth or if you want to want to play in an event i think being part of magic commentary and coverage has always been a dream slash goal of mine so getting to realize that with these opportunities like the players tour and now the players tour finals and uh, possibly more in the future has been incredible but at the same time i still have the competitive drive so it's really just using those tournaments to keep on top of the meta game all right. Well, this round, Monty, we've got two excellent players. Look, this is a stacked field. Uh, you know, we had a, a player meeting or a, a coverage meeting yesterday, and we kind of looked like Rich just sort of showed us what the sampling of the players look like from the middle part of the field, say your average player. And it was like ringer, 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 ringer. It was like, oh, wow, this field is super stacked. So you can expect really great feature matches. And we have a great one this round. We have Elias Watzfeld versus Martin Yuza. Let's take a look at what they're actually playing this round. And I know that you're going to be happy when you see this, Monty, because you are one of those people who loves a teamer mirror. And we're getting one of those here in round number three with such a huge percentage of the field plain teamer reclamation in one build or another we should be seeing a fair bit of these let's take a look at elias watzfeld's list here what stands out to you uh immediately the first thing i notice is the copy of nissa who shakes the world in the main deck nissa mm -hmm. a card that we've seen some players run in the past in teamer as this threat that you can get down fast with your ramp and really attack on another angle as well as further amplify all the mana you're making with wilderness reclamation uh notably elias does not have that many creatures in the deck we see some players choosing to have copies of brazen borrower or night pack ambusher both of those are missing from this main deck here from elias Interesting. So I, you could make the argument that this deck plays effectively no creatures, Uro Titan of, Ra of Nature's Wrath in the main deck there. But as we've seen, it does come back on the battlefield. But, uh, you know, three creatures total. Now Nissa can make creatures. Shark Typhoon makes creatures. It's not like there's not going to be anything on the battlefield. But an interesting take here for sure from Elias Watzfeld. Let's take a look now at what Martin Yuza has decided to bring to the table. Again, this is Teamer Reclamation, but the build is different. What do you make of Martin? Martin's build. So the changes between Martin's build and Elias's, notably Martin goes with a Joel Rail over the Nissa. Same idea of having a threat that's a little different from your normal angles of attack, but Martin's comes down sooner, so it's harder to interact with, with the cards in the matchup that are important, like the negates, like the Aether Gusts. Uh, speaking of Aether Gusts, Martin has one, whereas Elias had three and martin's replaced those slots with ops to make his joel rail better 
Oh, interesting. Okay, well, you know what? Players are ready. Let's head on down. It's time for round number three here from the Players Tour Finals. All right, so let's get underway here, Monty, as we look at our opening hand here for Wattsfeld. And it looks like he's got, well, a negate, a mystical dispute, and a teamer, excuse me, a wilderness reclamation and four lands. Is that is that a keeper? It, that was a snap keep from him as well, which I think is fine. You have two pieces <laughs> of interaction, so you're really able to interact with what your opponent is doing and just feel kind of safe that you're not going to be on the back foot because you're on the play you may even be able to land this reclamation before martin has something to interact with it and then you're just feeling great right you know the cards that i always look out for in the mirror here are of course growth spiral as you know a way to get one step ahead of your opponent but also cards like what you see here with negate and mystical dispute to potentially stop your opponent from enacting that strong game plan early. And you see a pretty reactive hand here from Wattsfeld with now three counter spells and a wilderness reclamation. Yeah, and that was interesting because how the player's hands worked out with no growth spiral for Elias meant that he played the uh, tap land on turn two, which let Martin know that he doesn't have to bluff a counter spell and allowed him to resolve his Temple of Mystery without putting the shields down. So already we're seeing what one person represents defines the actions of the other as we see Martin has drawn all four wilderness reclamations already. <laughs> He's got four in his hand and it's kind of interesting because you know you might think well maybe just slam one on the battlefield I got to work through the counter spells but of course that would leave Martin open to a wilderness reclamation from Wattsfeld which is a bit of a disaster, but that is exactly what Martin's going to do. He just throws a Wilderness Reclamation on the stack and says, let's just have a little fight here. Wilderness, oh, excuse no. me, Grow Spiral in response here from Wattsfeld is going to uh, give him up to three lands so he can choose either to use his Mystical Dispute if he feels like he just wants to get it out of his hand or fire off a negate here. Wow, and he even drew Nissa, Mani. So lots of options now for Wattsfeld on his turn. Yeah, and that Nissa was a huge draw because before Elias was just resolving a Wilderness Reclamation, but now this Nissan resolved and thanks to Breeding Pool, he's still representing the gate. So the shields aren't even down from Elias. What a what a sick rip there from Wattsfeld. That's a one of in the main deck for him, that Nissa who shakes the world. And boy, you can see how she got that name because boom, the world is never going to be the same again for Martin Yuza, at least as it comes to uh, game number one here, as he finds himself way behind having gotten a second copy of Wilderness Reclamation negated by that breeding pool that you just mentioned. So yeah, this one may have slipped away from him with that turn sequence. There's an arrow off the top. Yeah, part of it is Martin has four Wilderness Reclamations, which in theory might be okay if you're going to brute force it through and then eventually land one into an explosion on the same turn. Unfortunately for him, Elias' draw lined up so well, as we said, he snap kept a hand with multiple pieces of interaction and three counter spells means that Martin will just keep spending turns trying to cast Reclamation. Normally not a problem, except Elias drew one of the few pieces of pressure that he has in his deck, allowing him to put Martin under the gun in multiple ways here. So now wakes up another land, attacks, gets in for three, chump block by Martin Yuza with his baby shark. And now he's deciding if he wants to go for, for Uro here and perhaps leave up Mystical Dispute. And he's just gonna do Shark Typhoon, it looks like. Yeah, we're already on Elias' end step here, so he's looking to cycle the Shark Typhoon, really thinking about how much and whether he feels like he needs to continue leaving up this Mystical Dispute. Obviously, the dangers of not doing so is if Martin is able to go Wilderness Reclamation again, however unlikely it may be, and fire off an explosion to refill his hand, he may still be able to stabilize this game. Opt in response here from Martin Yuza. And there you go, a huge shark here, a 6-6 six, six flying shark that does give 
lethal on board here for Elias Watzfeld, so Martin Yuza is going to be forced to deal with not only the board in front of him, at least in some way, but also TikTok Nissa is up to seven loyalty, and that's going to be game number one going to Martin, excuse me, Elias Watzfeld. Boy, that sequence was just brutal from Martin. It went from bad to worse. He fired off the Willingness Reclamation, got it countered. He knew that was going to happen, or at least had a good idea, and thought, well, what's the worst thing that could happen? Elias could probably resolve his, old, his own Willingness Reclamation, but then he has to have something to back it up, and maybe we can have a fight about it. And no, it got a lot worse than that. It was actually Nissa untap breeding pool, negate your next Wilderness Reclamation, and uh, it was cruising from there for Elias Watzfeld. So that is game number one going to him. And now the players are, of course, consulting their sideboards. When it comes to sideboards and even main decks here, Monty, we have seen the players hedge quite a bit towards this matchup, right? This is, this is what you think about when you play uh, your test games and stuff is how am I going to be able to beat the mirror? What do you think uh, about Elias's plan to actually do that? Uh, Elias definitely came with the mirror in mind. We know that Elias played, I believe, the mirror in the finals of the uh, Players Tour 1 that he was actually the champion of. So he's already very proficient in the matchup. And some of the card choices in this list, like the one of Narcissus Reversal, like the lean main deck with tons of counter spells, three ether gusts, really just nodding more towards that. Something that we see here in the sideboard is Elias is choosing to keep all the copies of Ether Gust in and actually opting to not bring in something like Night Pack Ambusher so far, going for more of a continued lean game plan and using those cards he has like Commence the Endgame, like Discontinuity, like Narcissus Reversal to get more advantage in the matchup. All right, well, let's see if it works here. One to the good for Elias Watzfeld, and uh, we're in round number three here at the uh, Players Tour Finals. We're really happy that you decided to join us and watch some standard. I'm Marshall Seckliff. I'm with Monty Davuti, and uh, let's see how this game number two plays out between Martin and Elias. Of course, we've got players from all over the world participating in the event given that it is remote. We're actually remote on our commentary as well, but of course the players are too. So a little bit extra perhaps planning or uh, maybe a little consistency for the players. I know that when it comes to international travel, that can actually have a big effect on how the players uh, play. Now, given that this is taking place on West Coast time uh, in North America here, uh, you know, Maybe you did have to get up early or late, but you knew it was coming and it was your bed. So <laughs> hopefully uh, that's a little better for the players as far as that part goes. Yeah, it's really awkward for Elias because all three blue sources that he had in his hand came into play tapped in the form of the Castle of Antresses and the Fabled Passage for an Island. So he wasn't able to represent the turn one mystical dispute, which allowed Martin to resolve a growth spiral with the peace of mind that it would come into play without any problems. And now Martin has got a Night Pack Ambusher into play, which will eat an Ether Gust. Wow. So huge Ooh. advantage for Martin early, demanding answers. But it looks Elias like Martin's made... going to get some value here. Whoops. Elias made a big misplay there. Uh, he yes. cracked his Fable Passage before putting a fourth land into play, uh, thinking, well, I'll play a fourth land and then I'll Aether Gust this Night Pack Ambusher. Unfortunately, with only three lands, the Fable Passage basic came into play tapped, and Elias was no longer able to do that, now falling massively behind. Wow, that went from bad to worst for Wattsfeld, already facing down a Night Pack Ambusher with the only answer being an Aether Gust, not the position you want to be in Elias' seat. And now it's horrendous. Martin Yuza gets to have all of the mana available to him, as well as create a 3-3 Wolf on that end step there. And this is going to make Elias Wattsfeld's life extremely difficult. Are th is there anything out of the sideboard or, or, or a way to come back here that's, that's realistic for Wattsfeld at this point? Well, Elias's build has really focused on being good against Night Pack Ambusher as well. We saw him keeping in all three copies of Aether Gust, and there's also two copies of Commence the Endgame to try to ambush it during combat. Uh, mm. So there's definitely still play to the game here, especially because Martin's hand doesn't interact well. It's very pressure focused. Uh, 
However, Marta has that shark typhoon that Elias has no answers for right now. You know, all I really want in life, Monty, is w I, I just love it when players just play Shark Typhoon, just cast it. Ugh, it makes me so happy. <laughs> it, it's not often right. When it is, it feels incredible as someone who has cast many Shark Typhoons in my day. But here, I don't think we're going to see it, unfortunately, for you. Yeah, I, my guess is it's like... You no, know, it's probably like 5% of the time or less where it's actually correct to do so because Shark Typhoon so incentivizes you to cycle. I mean, getting the card back and, you know, instant speed, all the other things that come along with that are so incredibly important. But it was rare where it is okay to just cast it. It's incredible. I, it usually does just completely take over in a turn or two. Absolutely. One thing that's really interesting here is the one copy of Discontinuity in Elias' sideboard has to have Martin thinking about the timing of this Shark Typhoon cycle. Uh, if he waits too long and tries to do it on Elias' end step and gets met by a Discontinuity, his hand suddenly does close to nothing and his entire pressure is gone. So I'm not sure if Martin's thinking about it, but that is something that is really important at this stage of the game right now. My guess is that Martin is definitely thinking about it. Martin is a very careful player in the sense that he loves to really try to sort out all of the things that could possibly go wrong, then suss out if he could play around them or not, and then sometimes play around them even when he can't. <laughs> Yeah, and I wouldn't be surprised to actually see Martin go for a line like Growth Spiral into uh, the Night Pack on top rather than this. But nope, there it is. Ooh. That negate off the top for Martin is going to be really problematic considering before he had no answers for the explosion and now he's feeling so safe. Yeah, it's also beautiful for Yuza here. Uh, Elias on 14 life and seven power on the board for Yuza. He just needs to maintain this board state for one more turn to seal the deal. We're going to see Castle Vantress activated now by Elias Watzfeld as he digs around trying to find even more action. But that negate could absolutely be a game changer here for Yuza. Yeah, and I think we saw Martin consider casting the night pack ambusher he's moved it up to the front of his hand uh so he's definitely thinking about it because elias has given him the window tapping out for this castle vantress uh on his end step mm. is there a way that that goes poorly for yuza absolutely if martin does that and leaves up only four mana casting negate means he's no longer able to pay for a mystical dispute on his expansion explosion whereas now we're actually going to see martin win the game on the spot here being able to negate this explosion and pay for double dispute so he gets heavily rewarded with a game win because of choosing to not cast that ambusher Wow, great stuff from Martin Yuza, showing a lot of patience there, just recognizing, look, I've got seven power on the battlefield. I just need to, to make sure that I maintain this, and it is going to pay off big time. In fact, exactly for Yuza, as he can pay two mana for negate, and then three and three with all of his eight mana to pay for both copies of Mystical Dispute. Imagine being in Martin Yuza's seat and thinking, okay, if Elias has Explosion, I can negate it. Well, what if he has... A mystical dispute well i can pay well what if he has another mystical dispute like what if his hand is literally you know expansion explosion mystical dispute mystical dispute i'm gonna play around that as well and it's gonna pay off for yuza here big time getting him game number two and forcing a game three decider between him and elias watsfeld great stuff from yuza yeah, that was absolutely masterful for Martin, just really taking his time, being patient, and thinking about how do I get punished for any card I play, and how do I prevent that? And there it is, the concession from Elias Watzfeld. Martin Yuza evens things up at one game apiece, and the players will once again check their sideboards and see if there's any changes they want to make. Of course, there are times when you do play draw decisions as far as what cards go in, perhaps uh, adjustments of game plans, you know, when it comes to uh, Elias' side as we're watching him sideboard at the moment. 
Yeah, Elias looks like he has a completely different configuration in mind for when he's on the play in the matchup rather than on the draw. I believe we saw all copies of Wilderness Reclamation actually being taken out. The Night Pack Ambushers came in, as well as the Awakening of Vitugazi that's in his sideboard. Well, that was a very quick mulligan there. Uh-oh, is this down to five? Oh, no, down this to five down to here. Five. Yeah, Elias Watzfeld is going to have to try to bring the best he can with a five-card opening hand here. And this is going to be very difficult from this point, just given the fact that he's so far behind. His hand is not very good either. He's got three lands, Spectral Sailor, and a Shark Typhoon. Yeah, you know, some things could happen from that, but it's going to take a while to develop. He has no way to defend himself uh, if Martin Yuza has, say, Growth Spiral into, you know, something great, one of his four drops, um, at least currently. And Martin's hand is great. Elias's hand bare bones obviously a mulligan to five but martin's hand is incredible he has interaction and pressure okay so things looking good for martin users we see the spectral sailor come down on elias's main phase he just windmills it not gonna fuss around with getting that thing mystical disputed uh he ended up not keeping the shark typhoon by the way Monty. he went for the discontinuity instead I really like this. I was going to mention that I think because Elias's hand is looking so desperate here, he may need to go for some sort of Hail Mary with discontinuity, maybe hoping to either get like a fabled passage from Martin or a cycled Shark Typhoon and just try to punk out this game by getting a win that otherwise shouldn't exist with his hand. And that is the right way to approach it, right? To take the long shot when you need one. Yeah, being two cards down in the teamer mirror is already a big ask. When your five card hand doesn't really have a hope of competing in terms of interaction, uh, the next possible hope is just try to Hail Mary it. All right, well, right now, Wattsfeld is going to try to lean on Spectral Sailor here as he's going to activate that on Martin's end step after the land hits for Yuza. Gets to draw an extra card here, and there's a negate off the top. Okay, okay. You got my attention here, Elias. Yeah, choosing no longer to attack because of that Shark Typhoon in Martin's head and may actually just be firing off the discontinuity here uh, to stop Martin from getting the Shark. And it looks like he decided to just let it happen. So what is the best case scenario for discontinuity uh, in the matchup? I think it's either a large shark on your end step or something like a commence the end game. Something you normally wouldn't be able to interact with that it can interact mm. with now is really nice, as well as if your opponent gets to a spot where they have to fire off an explosion on your turn. Okay. And so, you know, in, in that case, discontinuity acts as a kind of super, super counter. Exactly. It, and it does counter both parts of the Shark Typhoon uh, if you cycle it, right? They don't get the card either. Right. Discontinuity ends the turn, so it exiles everything that is on the stack. All spells, all triggers, everything. So as long as this doesn't happen after um, the discontinuity is cast, uh, like it doesn't go on the stack above it, it's going to get countered and get removed from the stack. Yeah, interesting little sideboard option there, though. As we noted, Elias has decided that the 2-2 shark plus card that Martin was going for wasn't worth the discontinuity there and just decided to keep it in hand. Now, that plus Fabled Passage and uh, a Growth Spiral and a Negate are all Elias has. When you look over at Martin's hand, you see six cards in hand here, including Brazen Borrower, a Negate, a Dispute, Expansion Explosion, and a couple of lands. But critically, Martin also has Wilderness Reclamation on the battlefield. Yeah, Martin feeling great. However, he's also, funnily enough, feeling under pressure because of the Spectral Sailor that came down on turn one, to the point where Martin will probably explosion it for two here. Crazy. It has drawn two cards, though, this game and put Elias back to, uh, you know, unmulliganed him, as it were. Oh, wow. Martin choosing to cycle catch your Triumph rather than explosion the sailor here. All right, the sailor gets to keep on sailing.
There's Elias Watzfeld's new least favorite card, Fabled Passage. It <laughs> led to his demise in game number two, but uh, this time it's all safe. He's got plenty of other lands to have the, the land be untapped. Yeah, and Elias's hand is still pretty awkward, but as long as he has the Sailor and Martin isn't putting on that much pressure, uh, he's feeling good. Okay, in comes the Medium Shark. And let's see if Martin can take advantage of this Wilderness Reclamation and, uh, and make something sweet happen. So far, not so much. He's kind of biding his time at this point. Yeah, I like the amount of patience Martin has shown with this explosion up to this point, just trying to leverage it for maximum cards when he does want to fire it off. It, it seems like with how long he's waiting for it, he may not be feeling as pressured by the Spectral Sailor as I originally thought he was. He does seem to be OK with with just having it sit there as he's had opportunities to take it off the battlefield but perhaps is leaning on that expansion explosion a little harder. And there goes that fabled passage now from Watzfeld. The <laughs> other notable thing for Martin is he doesn't feel like he has to do anything here because if he passes and Elias doesn't draw a card with Spectral Sailor, Martin's okay with that. If he does, he gets to make decisions with four less mana available from Elias in mind. All right, so it looks like Yuza is going to go for the uh, the shark here. And that gives him a 5-5 five, five shark. And the pressure is really mounting in the air at this point. That is now seven power that Elias Wattsfeld has to try to work through. And yeah, he has been able to draw a bunch of cards off of the Spectral Sailor. But as you mentioned, no Wilderness Reclamations even in the list at this point. The Sailor, you know, it's, it's easier to abuse that, you know, and force your opponent to deal with it if you have a Wilderness Reclamation where it could be two or three cards a turn at some point in the game. Right now, Martin says, well, if you want to just keep spending your four mana to draw a card, I'm just going to let you. Though at this point, it is now two cards. <laughs> the Spectral Sailor plus eight mana available for Wattsfeld here. Yeah, but you made a great point in that Elias shifts his deck and transforms it so heavily when on the play uh, to be that beatdown deck. When we see the copies of Awakening of Vitugazi and of the Night Pack Ambusher. So if there's no Wilderness Reclamations in his deck, Elias can draw two cards a turn here. But he's not going to have that snap turn moment where suddenly he goes double reclamation into explosion you with two pieces of counter backup those swings don't happen with this configuration of the deck interesting right because this deck as we know has a almost combo component to it right where it has those turns like you just described where they go oops gotcha i won and elias is trying to do it the hard way here now martin can look at the sideboard of Elias Wattsfeld, but that does not tell you what <laughs> Elias actually brought in. And yeah, that's going to be game that's there. Yeah, that is an exactly lethal for nine expansion explosion. And that is Martin Yuza picking up game number three and improving his record one better here out of round number three. So great job, Martin Yuza, for picking up the victory here. The Hall of Famer gets it done. Yeah, it's a really interesting uh, series of decisions from Elias that match with the sideboarding in game three, almost putting him in a position where he doesn't have a comeback anymore. And that gave Martin the window to keep putting pressure on without worry. Yeah, we never actually got to see that discontinuity fired off there by Wattsfeld either. I was a little bummed about that. <laughs> I kind of wanted to see it go. It's just such a cool card. I mean, the rules text on it is 
absurd, right? There's like parentheses that tells you what it all, what it means, but it just says end the turn. Like, meh, turn's over. That's it. I decided to end it. All right. What we're going to do now is we're going to take a short break. When we come back, though, we'll have more round three magic here from the Players Tour final. Don't go anywhere. It's yep. nice to see that, by the way. A little little face to face interaction here, right? Sometimes, mm -hmm. when you play games a lot, you can feel a little disconnected from your opponent. But it's one of the great benefits to our game is uh, these two gentlemen will remember this moment for the rest of their lives. Matt did find land source number two, Blink Moth Nexus, and now he has the Steel Overseer. But oh, this is going to be a huge is. blowout oh, here. Oh, this is so rough. Eli Loveman runs out the Is It Staticaster, takes down the Overseer, and strands the other two in hand for Matt Sperling. Matt Sperling will sacrifice the Ornithop here, but this game is over. Sperling finds cranial plating, but he's just down to three permanents left on the battlefield. Eli Loveman with the Is It Static Caster and the Double Mantis Rider draw has put too much pressure on Sperling. He's dwindled his resources. He's super far ahead, and he even has that extra copy of Phantasmal Image at the ready. So first things first, hit you for six damage. That's a lot of Three exalted, exalted triggers. triggers. Again, Matt has options here as far as blocking goes. He doesn't actually need to. He's going to fall down to four life. So champion of the parish here. And then I can see a phantasmal image here being played, maybe copying Reflector Mage targeting the Arcbound Ravager. But that would do it. There it is, Galvanic Blast off the top of the library. It is completely uncastable as it has been this entire game. And we are on the verge of our champion. There's another Reflector Mage off the top of the library as well to send the last creature packing on the battlefield. There it is, Reflector Mage on the stack. Sperling's going to think about it and scoop up his permanence. We have our champion, Eli Loveman of the United States, is your Mythic Championship winner here from London. Congratulations, Eli. And welcome back to coverage here of the Players Tour Finals. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe with Monty Davuti. And our next round, or I should say our next match, this round that we have coming up is pretty cool. So yes, there is another Teamer Reclamation list in the feature match area. And taking a look at it, it's in the hands of Yol Larson. So a heavy hitter to say the least here in round number three. Now, across from him is going to be Michael Jacob, but Michael is not playing Teamer Reclamation. My, Michael has brought an aggressive Mardu Winota deck to the battlefield here. And uh, let's head on down and see how this thing plays out. All right, so Mani, what do you make of this matchup? Uh, Mardu Winota, how would you describe this deck? Is it mid-range, is it combo, is it aggro, what is it? This deck is pure aggression. In the past, we've seen some combo-oriented builds of Winota that are really trying to get a larger creature out there. For this deck, it's just about further putting pressure on when you land a Winota. Some of the cards that you can get with Winota, like Judith, uh, are just going to make you so resilient against board wipes as well. So trying to be that over-the-top aggro deck. And just as you say that, raise the alarm. <laughs> it's the battlefield here for, for Michael Jacob, a card you don't see super often. But there it is. Yeah, and Michael <laughs> and has a the curve here. here. <laughs> yep. Oh, man, look at this venerated Loxodon on everything. This is massive. Wow. There is. This is a huge board. 12 power being presented from Michael Jacob on turn three. Unreal. What a huge curve out here from Michael. Turning uh, lemons in the lemonade here. Last step Reaver and raise the alarm. No, no, no. All of a sudden, a huge board to overwhelm Yol Larson with. What can Yol do? This is both players putting the pedal to the metal. As you see, Wilderness Reclamation hit the battlefield now for Larson. Yeah, and 
Yol's deck does not play any copies of Storm's Wrath in the main deck, so taking 12 here and doesn't really have any way to interact with the full board, so even if he was to untap and land an explosion on the biggest creature on the board, there would still be lethal facing him back. <laughs> what an insane curve out from Michael. Oh, man. One of the things we're seeing from Yul's deck here is this Mardu deck doesn't play that many red cards. It only plays Winoda, Judith, and one copy of Tajik in the main deck that are red, I believe. So this Aether Gust just chilling in Yul's hand with no targets as he gets brutally beat down on the third and fourth turns of the game. I'm always curious to see for the players that choose not to play, you know, Teamer Reclamation or these type of decks, how much they play into Aether Gust because it has just become so commonplace to see main deck Aether Gust in some number from multiple different archetypes at this point uh, that, you know, we forget, I think, that Aether Gust is, you know, it's meant to be a sideboard card, right? Like, there's not that many formats where you can just gleefully play a card that only targets things of two different colors and just run two of them in the main. And we've even seen some versions of standard where people were playing more than that. Uh, and you, if you can find a build that really dodges it, or at least mostly dodges it, you can, you can get an edge for sure. Absolutely, and that's something that we've seen with the mono white deck that's been popping up as well, is these decks are looking at the builds that are coming out in the format that are just so heavily warped because of the dominance of Team of Reclamation in this metagame. We see cards like Mystical Dispute, Negate, and Aether Gust, which are all either traditional or just certainly designed to be sideboard cards, being played as three to four copies of in the main deck and asking themselves, how do I take advantage of this? We see Uro here to go back up to 11 now for Larson. Is there any way out at this point, though? We see Shark Typhoon in hand as well as the Wilderness Reclamation Trigger Expansion Explosion available as well. Hmm. Larson is able to fire off an explosion for two on this Woe Strider and still make a 1-1 Shark to block this Venerated Loxodon, which would put him at three life, but there's just not much of a follow-up after that. Okay, especially given that, that that explosion is now gone, so the combo potential is is lower. An another Aether Gust into hand for Larson. And this is exactly what Michael was hoping for with this particular draw. Everything into the red zone. Baby Shark's going to come down, jump in front of the elephant. But as you mentioned, 2468 is going to knock Larson right on down to three. And look at, look at the hand. Two dead cards in hand so far. Yeah, there's a Nissa. I mean, really powerful stuff available here for Larson sort of from a big picture perspective, but the pressure is just way too much as we see Michael Jacob continue to add to the board here, four more 1-1 one -one tokens as he says, your move, do your best. <laughs> I love it. Michael Jacob, look, this is an open decklist event, Marshall. Michael knows that Yol has no board wipes in his main deck. And he says, the only way you interact with my deck is negate on these four raise the alarms I have. Oh, you're <laughs> tapped out? I'm just going to resolve them. Deal with it. Oh, man, I love it. Michael Jacob just dropping the hammer here against Teamer Reclamation in the hands of Yol Larson. But I will note... This is only game number one, and this is where Michael really can take advantage of some of those uh, those situations that you just mentioned. And I'm really curious to see what Yoel Larson has as far as sideboards go and what he wants to bring in. You know, if you are a team or reclamation player, you, you have to consider the mirror match when you build your deck and your sideboard. But also, there have been some aggressive decks that have popped up, and they can be a real problem for you too, right? Absolutely, and your sideboard is definitely prepared for this. We see, just as a quick count, at least nine cards here, all geared towards the aggressive matchups. So I think we're going to see a dramatic shift post sideboard in how Yol's deck configuration is, trying to target this aggressive deck for Michael. Yol's trying his best here. He does find another copy of Expansion Explosion. And he's got Uro back on the battlefield. And now we see Winoda 
Although this is actually... All right. Game. The first Ether Gust <laughs> target of the game? Yes, that's what I was going to say, but it also uh, prompted a concession. And we see Yol immediately jump into the sideboard. Let's see what he wants to bring in, and also importantly, what he wants to bring out. Yeah, we see Elder Gargaroth, one of the big cards in Yol's sideboard, and a very brutal card against aggro. We see Yol also put in two copies of Storm's Wrath, a copy of Soul Seer, two copies of Bone Crusher Giant as well, all tools that will help keep the aggro deck in check and allow Yol to just snowball the game in his favor rather than against him. So how do you, if you're sitting in Yol's seat, with the particular choices that he's made for the sideboard, I know you've played a heck of a lot of teamer. Um, are you feeling pretty good or is this still a, you know, pressure situation for, for Yo Larson as far as game number two goes? I'm definitely feeling better post board but i don't mm -hmm. think you're feeling good against the specific deck i think this marta winota deck is very hard targeting teamer with his card choices and i don't know that yol has enough in his sideboard to really feel excellent about the matchup all right as we see michael jacob putting the the finishing touches on sideboard plants there as well Interestingly, it looks like these players are 1-1-0. One, one and oh. hmm. Yeah, I, I believe that's one win and one loss. The third column is the draws in this tournament. Oh, uh, so right, I okay. believe Duh. they are 1-1 one, one at the moment. You're right. Yeah, that makes a lot more sense. <laughs> <laughs> one thing we didn't talk about before in Michael Jacobs' deck is a card that mm -hmm. we haven't seen that much of in standard recently but it used to be an all-star kite self freebooter as a four of in this list oh yeah for sure and this is the type of card that can be really annoying if you're in yol's seat no doubt about it yeah yol has a lot of tools but one thing we spoke about was he only has two copies of Storm's Wrath and he only has two Bone Crusher Giants. There's not that many removal spells that are able to get a Kite Sail Freebooter off the board. And it looks like a quick mulligan here for Yoel Larson in game number two. He's going to put Brazen Borrower on the bottom. But as you can see, he has a removal heavy hand with the, the double giant plus the Soul Seer. So. There you go. As far as mulligans well, go, this says is... That... Yeah, let me... So, uh, apparently, is it Michael's that... Michael Jacob that went to 61 cards? Oh, it's possible that Michael submitted a 61 card deck. I didn't notice. <laughs> I didn't either, but, but the chat... A bunch of people said 61 card special, so... <laughs> Huh, interesting. I wonder if that was a conscious choice or whether he just didn't really realize. Interesting. Well, let's get underway here. Bone Crusher Giant doing good things here uh, on the battlefield already for Larson. But there it is. Kite Seal Freebooter to take away the Soul Seer. But that does leave the other Giant in hand, of course. Can't take that one. Oh, big Gargs, though. Although, is there any green mana in sight right now? <laughs> Zero. Oh, no. So we're not going to see an Elder Gargaroth a, a next turn under any scenario here. And uh, I think Larson would be happy to find a green source just to get this Uro down as well. Yeah, as far as being down on cards and behind goes, Yol doesn't hate his position here. Again, Bone Crusher Giant, one of the most powerful cards that he has in this matchup, because not only is it a targeted removal for the creatures that matter like Freebooter or Judith, but the 4-3 body blanks most of the other attackers from Michael Jacob. All right, well, Michael does land this venerated Loxodon once again. Ooh. Ooh, good timing, though. Storm's Wrath off the top of the library here. And uh, Larson, oh, he's going to wait, though. Interesting. Hmm. Why did he wait? So I think 
Yol is trying to get more out of this while recognizing that he has a Soul Seer in his hand in case Michael tries to play Winoda and attack from that route. Uh, uh, saying okay. that I think I have enough on the board with this Bone Crusher to stymie your attack right now. And yeah, it's working out for him so far. Yeah? He, he could get, uh, this could uh, end up working out well for him, get a little extra value. Yeah, I think this worked out perfectly for Yol because now Michael is going to have essentially no board when Yol Soldier Trans this turn, and then Michael will have to develop again while Yol finally draws a Greenland. Right, so there's a Ketria Triumph off the top there for Larson as he fires off the big sweeper, wiping away every creature on Michael Jacobs' side of the battlefield and making cards like this, Judith, not look quite as good here. Judith really wants to have a board, and we're talking about a 2-2 for 3 here. Not great for Michael Jacob. Patience from Yoel Larson to get a little extra value could go a long way, and now he finds a green source again and just slams Elder Gargaroth and says, your move. Yeah, your move is... And that's going to do Let's it. go to game three. Wow, impressive stuff. And I got to say, that top deck, right, just ripping that uh, that Storm's Wrath off the top there for Yoel Larson, huge. Which, whichever way he decided to play it, it ended up being plenty enough to get the job done. And then, of course, finding the green source into green source there helped to seal the deal with the Gargfar there, the uh, Elder Gargaroth there, which is a really big problem for those aggro decks, right? I mean, they just have to deal with that thing, like, now. Absolutely. The fact that Gargadon, Gargaroth triggers on attack and block means that mm -hmm. the turn it comes down, it plays defense plenty well. So if you're not already in a bad board position or life total uh, when you land the Gargaroth, then it's going to be really hard for the aggro deck to come back from that. And at that point of the game, you'll played it on an otherwise empty board, except for a Judith while at 18 life. Exactly. Oh, there is 61 cards for Michael Jacob. Let's see if he's still considering cutting or if he's actually going to submit this. Oh, 60. No fun. <laughs> oh, Wait, is he back up? He's back up. Is he just playing 61 cards? Not in can his list. Can you do that? He, you can. There you can board go. up. Oh, yeah, 60. no, no, right. I know it's within on, the Michael. rules. <laughs> <laughs> are, are you allowed, though, right? <laughs> All right exactly. Mike. 60 cards. Okay, okay. How wild would that have been, though, if Michael Jacob just figured out that his aggressive Mardu Winota deck is supposed to go up to 61 cards in the matchup against Team of Reclamation? <laughs> Chat asked, uh, when is the Basri's lieutenant brought in? And the answer is, it's actually in the main deck. There's, uh, there's four of those in the main, although it looks like... Uh, not at the moment here, as we're entering game number three, Yoel Larson versus Michael Jacob. Yeah, I believe are uh, Michael had boarded out two copies of the Lieutenant uh, in game two. I didn't quite see if he brought some back in when he's on the play in game three. Wow, chat's got the hot takes today, by the way. Oh, hit me. Lay it on yeah. me. I think if you play 61 cards, you should be allowed to use the old companion rule. <laughs> Come on. That is a very hot take. Scorching hot. All right, we see the um, Kaisel Freebooter come down early here and start to do what it does best. Are we going to see another one? No, it's going to be a Lazatep Reaver, although that's going to prompt a stomp. These stomps yeah, are pretty I'm good against the, uh, yeah, against Freebooter. Yeah, I'm a little surprised that Michael actually took the expansion explosion rather than 
the Storm's Wrath. Uh, obviously, because Bone Crusher Giant is a creature on his front side, you can't take it with the Kite Self Freebooter, making it the perfect answer there. Okay, a little bit of pressure here st still for Michael Jacob with the last step Reaver and the, the zombie army pecking in for a couple of damage, knocking Yol Larson down to 17. Hmm. Yeah, Michael is considering have to do better playing than that. the Kite Sail Freebooter here rather than the Basri's Lieutenant uh, just to take the Storm's Wrath that... Uh, Actually, does he not know about either Storm's Wrath? They don't appear to be revealed. Yeah, so, yeah. Chat, chat mentioned that just now too. That the reason he didn't take it is that Yol drew it the next turn, and then apparently has dropped another one as well. Ooh, that's brutal for Michael, actually. Well, but what about the mana situation here from Larson? Oh, he doesn't have a no fourth, fourth land, land. And right? Being forced to ether oh, gust man. this Winota. Yeah, this is just to uh, kind of buy some time here. What is happening? I think we're just adjusting a few settings here. There's no way that Larson's scooping here, but. Oh, I see. Uh, I believe Yol is trying to do this ether gust after the. Uh, draw step even though it looks like we're already in the main phase all right yeah oh okay all right well there's another kite sail freebooter but it's not good news for michael jacob there's two copies of storm's wrath so he can't realistically stop larson from being able to cast it if yol can find another red mana source here in the next turn or two uh, well that isn't gonna do it that isn't going to do it. And now, because Michael had full information on the rest of Yol's hand, he knows that the coast is clear for going raise the alarm into Winota here and an all-out attack. Oh. And there it is. Boom, 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 boom. Four triggers on Winota. And what can he hit? Well, the triggers are covering up whatever's being hit, but there are things entering the battlefield. And look at this turn from Michael Jacob. Oh this has That's gotten completely insane. out of control. Oh my God, look at that turn. Wow. Wow. Incredible. What a victory there for Michael Jacob going from hitting in for a couple of damage a turn to a massive attack to finish off the match and give the win to Michael Jacob. Boy, you gotta feel for Larson, just one red mana source away from perhaps stabilizing that board, but he couldn't find it in time. And Michael Jacob with Winota, you were not kidding when we came into this round, Monty. I said, how would you describe this deck? Kind of combo a little more mid-range, aggro. You said pure aggro, and we saw a massive Winota turn to finish off the game there. Yeah, Michael's deck, once its Winota triggers go on the stack, it's not about getting value, it's not about going over the top of your opponent, it's about ending the game. You have Judith's, that's an anthem that you can hit off of this Winota trigger. Super cool. Yeah. Yeah, there's nothing quite like hitting an anthem that's also attacking itself and pumping everything else in combat that your opponent didn't know was coming. Like these are these are the types of plays that can be game changers just with like a reasonable attack step. And that attack step got really not reasonable really fast once Winota hit four out of four, including a beautiful bevy of different creatures that were pumping and, and doing all of that. Incredible stuff from Michael Jacob finishing off the victory there. And again, how close was that for Yoel Larson? Like if he had drawn a mountain there, would we still be in that game and seeing what happened? Or was he, was he uh, you know, more behind than it seemed? It would still be a game, but I don't know if it would have been enough for Yoel to come back. He was still pretty far behind. Yeah, it did look pretty bad. All right, well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take another short break. But when we come back, we've got even more round three action for you. Don't go anywhere. So again, the pressure is on Nelson. 
as Matias has been able to yep. continually come up with the things that he needs. Could he not have cast Callus Dismissal and, and, and have just, just won the game? just won the game because right? he would if have he, had 7, 14, 21. Exactly. That's a three-turn call with the two Nexus of Fates and Wilderness Reclamation. He could have just won the game. 3, 6, 7. 14, 21. He was at 22 then, right? Because he just took three. No, no, he gained two life because of Oath of Kaya triggered. Oh, so he was right. at 20 life? Yeah, you, you pay two mana, you bounce something, you get a 1-1. One, one. You have three lands untapped, you tap all three of them. Wilderness Reclamation triggers, you tap all of them, and uh, you cast Nexus of Fate. You attack the next turn, you do the same thing again, and that is lethal. Oh my. A slight opening here for Brad Nelson. There is a chance now here for Brad. Just making sure he runs the numbers here. He has plenty of lands. He can just Callous Dismissal, Oath of Kaya, attack Brad for six, then next turn attack for seven, and Leverado has this. He's going to win. Leverado has Mythic Championship 3 in his grasp. All he needs to do is fire off one more Nexus of Fate, and he's got Unbelievable. Lethal. Unbelievable. And that is going to do it. Matthias Leverado works his way through an incredible field of top-tier professionals, and he is your champion. Congratulations, oh, Matthias. My goodness. What a game. He was so close to dead on game two. He looked through every single possible card to get to the point where he could find the, with the last remaining card to see. He found Nexus of Fate to come back in game two, and then game three taking it down. Wow. Unbelievable. Faces down the standard master. And welcome back, everybody, to coverage here of the Players Tour Finals. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe, that's Monty Davuti, and we're both super happy that you decided to come along and check out round three with us. Now, we've already brought you our main match and our secondary match. We've got another one. We're going to pop in here on game number two of Ryuji Murray versus Jason Florent. This matchup is one I anticipate seeing a fair bit here. It's Teamer Reclamation versus Ban Ramp. Let's take a look at that match right now. As we join it, again, Ryuji Murray is up a game. And uh, we're going to see if Ryuji can uh, can finish, can seal the deal here, or if Jason Florent can find a uh, a third game here to uh, to play for this match. Now, ooh, look at this. We've got we, we better know our card names, huh, Monty? Yeah. Uh, fortunately, I am well familiar, at least, with Jason's side of things, as that is a bat list that I have been playing a lot this season. Ah, interesting. So where do you feel Bant is positioned or how do you feel it's positioned coming into the tournament with Teamer kind of, you know, being the headliner? I think Bant is the growth spiral deck that has a even to slightly favored matchup against Teamer Reclamation without being Teamer Reclamation. If you don't want to be playing Teamer Mirrors, uh, I think Bant is where you want to be. All right. And I will remind you that this is game number two. So we are seeing post sideboard uh, lists here as you see cards like Questing Beast, which uh, I don't know if he's actually main decking a Questing Beast, but that isn't something you see very often out of Teamer. Yeah, it looks nope, like. Nope, but it is a card that Ryuji has one copy one. of in his sideboard. Mm hmm. And one copy I of have in seen... his hand, as it turns out. Yeah, I've seen some teamer players sideboarding this card uh, against Bant specifically as a way to pressure uh, to fairy uh, the creatures that Bant is making off of Jorel to present as blockers aren't really doing a good job of blocking the questing beast. So now you no longer have the safety net of oh to fairy resolve. I have some time before they're able to answer it. As you can see, things on board looking pretty good for Jason here. Just got a little yeah. army going, but applying some serious pressure. I mean, if you look, Ryuji is already down to 13. He kind of needs to start getting something rolling here. Absolutely. And Ryuji does not really have the cards in his match in his hand to answer this board. Perhaps going to lean heavily on those four drops you see. 
Yeah, and Jason can actually play around this knife hack ambusher by playing a six land before combat to threaten the Jorel activation. All right, so there's the ambusher. Is it actually going to get to ambush something here? So here's the unfortunate part for Jason. I think given the build of his hand, uh, he's going to feel a little safe here to go second Jorel to ferry, bounce your ambusher, make a token. Now I have to ferry. Unfortunately, there's the questing beast we talked about waiting in Ryoshi's hand. So now Jason more or less threw away the backup copy of Jorel that he had, and he's going to lose his Teferi to this questing beast. Oh, questing beast. This is, of course, an extremely powerful magic card. It has found its footing in standard. A stretch, although it has had its time, no doubt about it. But it is interesting to remember that cards like this exist, right? That like Questing Beast is just, you know, fallen to the wayside as far as these Bant and Teamer decks go basically completely. You know, in this case, there's one in the sideboard total. Um, but boy, oh boy, when these type of cards hit, they certainly have their place. As you see, it knocks Jason Florent down to 14 and kills Teferi in the same uh, same attack there. Yeah, but what now we're about to see the power of Jorel. As soon as Ryuji passes the turn back, Jason can activate after drawing his card, and he'll have four creatures with four power each, which means Ryuji's just dead. Wow. Crazy. Yeah, Jorel is a card that really allows the Bant deck to have pressure in a form that it didn't have in the past. And normally this line of play would be devastating for Ryuji, but here it just resulted in him tapping out, which he had to because of Teferi, and losing the game. Incredible. Wow, that really turned uh, very, very quickly there. And Jason Florent picks up game number two victory and is going to force a game three decider. So now we get to once again consult sideboards here as we ride along with Ryuji Murray and figure out how he wants to approach this matchup because yikes, that looked like, you know, a situation where Murray could perhaps turn the corner and start to actually take control of the game. You know, a night peck ambusher gobbles up a creature. That's usually a good thing. You get, you know, uh, instant planeswalker kill out of your questing beast but the game was just over so i'm curious to see if ryuji murray makes some adjustments here yeah, there's something that I'm not sure if Ryuji is aware of. I know Jason, he's from Vancouver, he's a close friend of mine, and I spoke with him a lot, watched his stream, and helped him in his testing for this uh, matchup and this bat list. Part of it was the sideboard plan against uh, against Team of Reclamation, which is go super low to the ground, cut your Elspeth Conqueror's deaths, and actually ended up even shaving a land, really focusing on Jorel as your point of attack. And if Ryuji's plan is to sit behind counter spells, that may not work out so well for him against this specific playstyle. Oh, interesting. Wow, that could really be big time if that's the way that uh, Jason goes. Both of these players are 2-0 and coming into the round. You're getting uh, Canadian shout outs, by the way, in the chat. <laughs> shout out to my Canadian friends. There you go. And mine too. <laughs> oh, I miss Canada. I haven't been there in a while. I usually go up quite often. <sighs> Times have been rough, unfortunately. I miss Seattle. I have not been down in so long. Well, you, we can go We can go grab some, some food next time we're able to actually do that. How about that? Oh, absolutely. I cannot wait. Yeah, Marshall, I want to point out something you... interesting. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, Jason, in this game three, actually brought in a Shatter the Sky and an Elspeth Conqueror's Death. But something he didn't do was bring the planes back in. And I, I'm not sure if this was a bit of autopiloting, as it's not really a situation we really talked about in our preparation. But 
casting those five and four mana double white cards while cutting up planes from your deck is not the easiest thing. And I'm worried that may come back to punish him. All right, well, let's find out. Game number three underway between these two players. Ryuji does have an answer in his hand to Jora, which I really like. The stomp from the Bone Crusher Giant means that we're not going to see a repeat of game two with Jason just casting Jorel on two and snowballing the game away from Ryuji like he did before. Comes a uh, Bone Crusher Giant. Wow, Ryuji actually choosing to be the aggressor here. Interesting. Is that going to work out well for, for him? I don't think Land so. This is going to give four. Jason a window mm -hmm. to go Jorel plus Growth Spiral, make a token, have mana up. This Bone Crusher Giant is checking Teferi, but again, our game plan in the matchup isn't just solely focused around Teferi. Okay, well, how about a Wilderness Reclamation off the top of the library here? That's really nice. Now, Ryuji is going to be able to resolve the Reclamation, still have Negate and Shark Typhoon up to continue putting pressure on the Teferi that Jason has in hand but hasn't played yet. And I think I like his position much better now with that Reclamation draw. All right, let's see if that ends up changing the game here as land number five hits up for Jason Florent. He's got some options available. He's got the 2-2 cat, the Joel Rail already on the battlefield, a re redundant copy in hand. So perhaps just Uro to kick things off. Yeah, I think Uro to kick things off is very reasonable. The other option for Jason would be to try to land Teferi with the Mystical Dispute backup and just send it up if your opponent doesn't fight for it to protect it from a potential Shark Typhoon. What I do like about this play is it guarantees a cat from the Oro, and now Jason can try to play that aggressive Jorel gameplay again instead of playing into Ryuji's potential counter spells. You see the cat army starting to build here, perhaps applying significant pressure here to uh, Ryuji Murray, although in a passive way, at least at the moment. Can Murray take advantage of an expansion explosion, something like that, to just get a big step ahead? He can if he so chooses. Uh, it looks like instead he's going for the Shark Typhoon here. I would assume it's just a 3-3 for another blocker. Huh. Hmm, there's another copy. Yeah, Ryuji has access to a negate and expansion before this. So if Jason had gone for something like Teferi with a mystical dispute backup, Ryuji did still have two pieces of interaction left up to protect himself from it. From it. Uh, but Shark Typhoon was one of the really great tools you had against uh, Teferi here. It appears as if our feed may actually be frozen. Yeah, it is for me at the moment. I'm just hoping that it uh, it undoes. <laughs> but it looks like it is also for, for chat. So we'll just hang tight here for a moment and hopefully it'll, uh, we'll be able to clear it up on our end. We are broadcasting remotely, not just uh, for us, but of course the players are as well. So keep that in mind. And we appreciate your patience with things like this uh, throughout the course of the event. We are having to organize, you know, the players and sometimes even their webcams, um, you know, to stream and we record it and then we play it for you. Uh, there's also a tournament integrity reason behind that as well, in that we don't necessarily want to have the matches be literally live at that exact moment. So oftentimes, 
We'll just wait a few minutes and then start the stream uh, just for tournament integrity reasons as well. But as you might imagine, it is uh, quite a complicated uh, <laughs> setup that we have. But it looks like we're back in there now. So again, we appreciate your patience. And uh, let's see how things have developed. Well, the shark hit the battlefield. And as we see, there's those two copies of Expansion Explosion in hand for, uh, for Murray. Yeah, Murray, with that, since we first checked in on Murray, his last three draw steps have included a Wilderness Reclamation and two copies of Explosion. So a position that was once <laughs> kind of precarious has just continued snowballing and getting better and better for Murray. Yeah, it's funny. It's it's it just draw your super big hitters. I mean, the, these are, the, of course, the combination of cards that end many games in a matchup like this. And we're going to see an expansion actually copying a, uh, a negate, it looks like. To yeah, try to take that's care what of this, this allowed Ryuji to do. Uh, and now, because Ryuji knows that Teferi didn't resolve, if Jason has a, had another piece of interaction, he would have fought over it. So now Murray has free reign to resolve this explosion and just draw all the cards he needs to solidify his position in this game and take things away from Jason. Right, effectively 12 mana available here. Could be for the full eight, although Murray has uh, fairly consistently under explosion here to leave up well like the card in hand as you see yeah Let i love this decision for murray he doesn't want to risk not drawing a negate or ether gust and then being called to a nissa who shakes the world from jason one of the few ways that jason can land a slam dunk card in that window and try to steal this game from what is firmly in Murray's favor now, so really love this decision to leave up three mana for this dispute. So smart stuff for Murray. It takes out the Joel. There is a replacement now on Jason's turn, so immediately that card's back on the battlefield, but a nice read here from Murray, and it looks like Murray's going to fire off a Mystical Dispute just to take care of Uro. And yeah, this worked out beautifully. There's a growth spiral now for Murray, although it does just hit a land at this point. Yeah, Murray getting a little flooded, but fortunately, three of the lands that he's drawn are Castle Vantress, and the combination of Castle Vantress plus Wilderness Reclamation is one of the big reasons why this deck is so powerful. Even when you don't have anything to do with the insane amounts of mana you're producing, you're still able to scry anywhere from two to eight times a turn and really make sure that your next draw step is going to be a banger. So finally, the giant's going to attack. It trades off for two cats. And now we have a second copy of Wilderness Reclamation on the battlefield, both of them triggering. And as you mentioned a minute ago, Mani, really important because of the copies, in fact, two and another, an additional in hand of Castle Vantress. This almost seals the deal here as Murray's going to be able to just rip through that library and find whatever he thinks he needs to actually finish off this game. Yeah, unfortunately for Jason, with a copy of Negate in Murray's hand and no real interaction from him, he is in a lot of trouble here. However, this crisis will resolve as a 5-5. Okay. That's a start. It's a start. But, but again, oh, is, is that that's... it right there? The expansion explosion? Is that just game? I believe Two, three, that is four, 24 five, six, mana seven, from Array. 24, yeah. So that's 27 with the land. And, that's game. Yeah, and, and that's a tapped out Jason Florent. So we just saw the game go on top of the library here for Ryuji Murray looking to run up the score here on end step. And that's exactly what's going to happen. Yeah, you get a 3-3 wolf token, but that wolf token just gets to see some fire and lightning in the sky as it is going to rain down on Jason Florent here in the form of 20 plus damage to Jason's life total. Plenty enough to get the job done here for Murray. And there is the win. And yeah, might as well draw a bunch of cards while we're in there. Great job by Ryuji Murray picking up the victory with Teamer Reclamation oh, and Ramp from Jason Ferrand. And uh, yeah, that is our round number three, all wrapped up and done. We got to see three matches there. 
Great stuff down the stretch, though, from Murray. Yeah, absolutely. Murray had a bit of a slow early game, and I was really concerned for his position. But as the game went on and he was able to find that Wilderness Reclamation, able to find those explosions, there was just no shortage of gas for him and no shortage of ways to end the game when we got to the end. That's right. Well, thank you so much for joining us here for round number three. That is going to do it for Monty and I, at least for this round, but we'll be back again a little bit later in various forms. For now, though, we're going to take a short break. We'll be back with more action right after this. Two extremely experienced players here. Of course, Kai Booty, one of the most celebrated players we've ever had in a Magic Gathering, having won seven Pro Tours. It's a it's a unfathomable number at this point, unlikely to ever be eclipsed or even close to it. And sitting across from him, Shoti Asoka, one of the most respected players in the game. Absolutely, he's no slouch himself. We just have two Hall of Famers actually just going at it, you know, kind of the old school players who have been playing the game for quite some time, but proving that they still have it here, you know, still alive deep into Mythic Championship 3. Shota won a Pro Tour back in the day, a couple years ago. Shota is losing permanence and they're not coming back. And just, just additional insurance here, Oath of Kaya off the top, meaning Kaya now can just fire it off and sit at a comfortable five life here and not have to worry about a potential series of Oath of Kaya's that Shota could draw. Wow, incredible from Kai Buda. Anybody who doubted him coming into the tournament is surely a fool as he is going to stay alive for yet another round in miraculous fashion as well. Now he's just adding on. He's got Oath of Kaya, Oath of Kaya plus Ugin. And this one is going to be in the books. <laughs> I can't believe that Kai found a win here. I mean, he had to top deck two perfect cards in yeah, a row. The Duress and the Elder Spell? No, no, it was Command the Dread Horde oh, you're into right. the Elder Spell you're right, with to the, set that up. To set that whole thing up. Unbelievable game and a real pleasure to watch. Search for his Kanta is too little too late. Shota says good game, and Kai Buda earns the victory. He will survive to fight another day. Welcome back to the virtual news desk here. Riley and I joined by Cedric Phillips. And Cedric, we've had all sorts of stuff on the uh, on the screen for the players to or for the for the uh, viewers to enjoy this round. We had a Team of Wreck Mirror. We've had some spicy new Mardu tech. Uh, what, what did you make of the last round of competition? Hey, you mentioned that Mardu deck, little Mardu uh, Winona action. I wasn't expecting mm. to see that this weekend, but we did see our first Team of Reclamation Mirror, as you did mention. Of course, we're probably going to see more of those, so maybe a little foreshadowing. But it's always good to you know, see a little bit of this, a little bit of that. We've seen Mono White, we've seen Mono Green, we've seen Bant. So I know that 50% of this tournament is about Team of Reclamation or Wilderness Reclamation strategies, but you know, we're dabbling. And as you said at the beginning, you're hoping that these non-Reclamation decks keep on winning. Oh yeah, and I can tell you about one of them actually, I can tell you about a couple of them actually. I was out on our virtual floor, uh, chatting with people here and there. Ken Yukihiro, no breaks on the Esper mid-range train. There was a lot of talk about this deck heading into uh, this weekend. It's very innovative uh, with a huge, huge chip on its shoulder trying to beat uh, Team Reclamation. And uh, Ken Yukihiro beating other non-Reclamation decks, beat William Huey Jensen, two games to one, improving to three and O. Oh. It turns out that this Hello Blade Regisaur tie the take us special really seems to have what it takes putting uh, yuka hero to three and oh but another three and oh deck that is very exciting indeed is the uh, four color special brought by bolan zhang now it's not four color wilderness reclamation no bolan has brought four color super friends it's four color planeswalkers 13 planeswalkers in this list nasa teferi liliana and nickel bolus now i got the chance to catch up with bolan he said that he wanted to play a highly interactive deck. He likes to build his own mid-range lists, and he loves how well uh, Nars at his position against the various uh, 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 growth spiral decks, whether it's Bant or Team or Four Color. And uh, he's got a special affinity for uh, the Dragon God. Uh, Bolan told me he absolutely loves Nickel Bolas. In his words, he is in Bolas's clutches. So it's really good to see a, a, an, an actual true blue rogue deck getting it done at the top level of competition, three and O, oh, uh, which is. Uh, Really, really, uh, something to behold. It's it, it's quite spectacular there. So, 
That is the, sh uh, the shape of things at the end of round number three. We move on now towards move uh, towards uh, as we, sorry as we move towards uh, round number four. It's time for us to have a glance over the meta game. Of course, we talked about this a little bit earlier on, Cedric, but now's our chance now to go a little bit deeper and talk about what this represents, how how this is uh, reflecting the format, and uh, what the shape of standard is, I guess, in, in a broader sense. And of course, no surprises to see the team of reclamation well and truly uh, right at the top of the of this particular pile, etc. Uh, you know, it makes the most sense, really. If you're just taking a look at the results of tournament circuits and online play everywhere right now, Team of Reclamation is what is dominating the standard format. So it being 39.3% of the field, not a surprise to me at all. I actually think some players expected it to be more. But if you group in four mm. color Reclamation and that splash for Teferi, Dovin's Vito, and Kenrith, the returned king, we're looking at obviously 50% or more of the tournament is looking to cast Wilderness Reclamation. However, Riley, what stands out to me here, though, is that even though that's a large percentage of the metagame, once you kind of get into kind of the wonky decks that people are playing, that other column uh, with nine decks and 6.2%, that's where you get to your super friend strategies and some of the stuff that you've been checking out. But I'm looking at those monocolor decks, my friend. You know me. Mono green aggro, mm. mono white aggro, nine and eight copies uh, specifically, 6.2% and 5.5% individually. Uh, I love those strategies for this tournament. However, much like Martin Juza did say, because I know you talked to him, it would be, you know, it, you, it's difficult to convince yourself not to sleeve up Gross Pyro in a tournament like this. And I think a lot of people felt just like Martin did, and the numbers do bear that out, Riley, where, look, how many chances are you going to be able to play a deck that's this good and you want to pass up on that opportunity? Some people decided to, but it looks like a lot of people did not. We already talked about the fact that, you know, you don't want to walk away from a tournament like this feeling regret at your deck choice, right? This is a point that yes. was made earlier in the broadcast about how you don't want to walk away going, geez, well, if, I've, if only I'd sleeved up a different 75 or a different 95 in the case of some people, uh, you know, things would be very different. But uh, the metagame does bear out a broad, a broadly consistent picture. Wilderness Reclamation is un uh, unquestionably powering up the best archetype, the best archetypes in the format, whether you group together four color or team of sure you can split hairs there but cedric what i'm interested to discuss with you now is the second best deck right because there are these monocolored strategies whether it's uh, you know whether it's green whether it's white there's bam bam another growth spiral deck there's john sacrifice a, a, a deck that used to be the best you know a, a yeah. few months ago a john Rakdos sacrifice and then you get down to the the the, the i guess quote unquote pure to fairy decks the azorius control the esper midrange that sort of thing so what, what stands out to you once we get past uh wilderness reclamation I, uh, for me you know I, I didn't touch on bant ramp previously but i don't want to ignore that strategy because 17 players are playing it in this tournament that's 11.7 percent mm -hmm. and what that deck is is a deck that's very powerful we're talking about a lot of rares, a lot of mythic rares, and just a lot of a lot of powerful cards in general. Um, you know, if sometimes in Magic, you know, you can have synergy-based decks, you can have aggressive decks trying to poke a hole in the metagame, and sometimes you just go, how about a mythic? How about another mythic? How about another mythic? How about another mythic? Can you win? <laughs> and that's what this deck does sometimes. It's, how about a Hydroid Crisis? How about a Teferi? How about a Nissa? How about sometimes an Ugin? And the opponent goes, just leave me alone. Get these awesome cards out of yeah. here. You know, where are your commons and uncommons? <laughs> and that's what makes that deck so darn good. And I guess it does play, you know, an average card that's not a rare mythic like Grow Spiral. I guess that one's not that good. Yeah, exactly right. But uh, that isn't, of course, the only deck. It's definitely the, the well, it's not even the most uh, powerful deck playing Grow Spiral, of course, which is certainly a pillar of the current format. And as we turn our attention now to the feature match for round number four, we're going to see a lot of Grow Spirals as it's a team of reclamation mirror. It's being held between one of the uh, one of the players to a champions here, Akira Asahara, and his opponent here, Ali Warfield, who, of course, is the rival of both team wreck here akira asahara one of the most respected deck builders in japan every single gym, uh, japanese mpl player cited him as an influence um and when the best deck player uh, when the best deck builder in a country is turning up with team reclamation uh, you know it's obviously going to be very very good so we've got the old guard versus the new here akira asahara has been around for a long time been around the traps ali warfield uh on the up and up here and this is the 75 that she has brought to the table this time around so 
Well, as we take a look at these team of reclamation deck lists, of course, just like last time when I analyzed a mirror, I'm going to do the same thing here and say, okay, what are players bringing to the table to get an edge in the mirror match? Allie, you're seeing only two main deck copies of Negate, where some players are playing four. You're seeing three main deck copies of Ether Gust, which, depending on who you talk to, some players feel like it's really good in the mirror, others, not so much. Allie feels like it's strong enough in the mirror and in other matchups, starting three copies of that card. Night Pack Ambusher, we saw a lot of players starting two of that card. Uh, some players have elected not to play it at all in their main deck. Ali has two main deck copies. Throw in, of course, your four Shark Typhoons, Wilderness Reclamations, Expansion Explosions, Grow Spirals. That's your base for this deck. But again, those two negates, those three Aether Gusts, um, you know, those are the kind of cards that are going to stick out to you when you're looking at the deck building and saying, what am I trying to beat? Looking to gain a little bit of an edge in the mirror, but not a huge edge in the mirror like we saw with some players starting four negates. And obviously there's going to be four mystical disputes given how this format is shaped up. But if we take a look at Asahara's deck list, there's an additional copy of negate. There's three there. If you're looking for Nightpack Ambush, you're not going to see it. And instead, you're going to see Spectral Sailor, which is a huge card in the mirror and a horrible against aggressive decks. So you see the trade off there, right? You see someone who's saying, I want to beat the mirror. I'm not really worried about the other decks where Ali kind of hedged against the, the rest of the metagame. Asahara said, no, no, no. I know there's going to be a lot of wreck decks here. He was right about that. And I think he's advantaged in this matchup against Ali Warfield. Just because of that uh, that that game one uh, advantage, having something like a Spectral yep. Sailor, which can dodge all the removal that isn't being played, I guess. No one's playing Scorching Dragonfires. It uh, it dodges, you know, the turn one mythical dispute, what have you. Anyway, uh, before we get to the match between these two players, it's time to have a look at the standings as well at the end of round number three and see how the tournament is shaping up in its early stages. Well. Knock me down with a feather. At the top of the table, it is none other than Seth Manfield, one of the greatest players of all time. And he's joined, he's in good company as well. Alvaro Fernandez Torres, Andrew Beckstrom, Alan Wu, Jacob Wilson, uh, all names that would be very familiar to people, undefeated Christopher Larson, as well as Nicholas King, Ray Hirayama. As we move on to the second uh, second table, or second page of this table, I should say, we've got a couple of other names that people recognise. We already talked about Bolan Zhang, who is on that four-colour Super Friends list. Ali Warfield will be checking in with this round. Andrew Cuneo gainsay himself so plenty of zero uh, plenty of uh, zero loss players here cedric and uh, a, a real raft of raw talent coming the viewers way in the in the uh, in the following rounds yeah, a couple of them stand out to me. Uh, Asahara, of course, being 3-0. Ali Warfield, they're going to have a 3-0 match there. Tommy Ashton, an online grinder. He is in his element at 3-0. And I tell you, this Seth Manfield kid, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of him before, but it is shocking, <laughs> shocking, I say, to see him at the top of the stage. Yeah, we should, uh, <laughs> we should look into this guy a little closer, I think. Anyway, yeah. that is that from us to the desk. It is time to bring you live coverage of the next round. So stay with us. We'll be back with coverage of round number four with Daquan Watson making his coverage debut here at the uh, at the Players Tour Finals joined by Paul Chan. So stick around. We'll be back after this. It is the finals and it is getting real exciting down there. This one was looking like it was going to be over one, two, three punch for uh, to Ralph Zeverin from Germany, but not so quickly, says Alvaro uh, Fernandez Torres. He was mulligan to five, down two games in the sideboarded games, and somehow found a great draw and a win in game number three. It is now two games to one in favor of Severin. He's calm and cool. He's looking through. He, he got exactly what he needed to combat this excellent draw from Alvaro Fernandez Torres. Can he finish? He has walking ballista. He has walking ballista. So I think that's it. I think that just... Does that, he have enough mana? I think, well, he's not going to win right now. But like I said, Torres needed land plus ballista over the course of the next two turns. And this should lock it up, right? Because if You're he draws right. land, he's not going to have the ballista. So I think Torelf just has it here. There it is, a 5-5 five, five walking ballista, and there's really no way out here for Alvaro Fernandez Torres. It was simply too much from Taralf Zeverin over the course of this match. Alvaro fought hard, he fought long, but he is way too far behind to come back now, and surely Zeverin is on the brink of victory here in Barcelona. He's thinking about a card he could draw, but Damping Sphere certainly isn't it. And that's going to do it. You have your champion, <laughs> Toralf Zeverin. He looks over at his cheering section, and he's your champion. Oh, my goodness. One damage. He got down to one life. And he survives, turns it around, 
Ulamog exiling two key permanents in two of these games. And his friends are mobbing him. Look at that. Riley gave him a kiss on his head. They're all so excited Amazing friends. for Toto Ralph <laughs>